What's up, Navigating Academia? This is your buddy, Dr. J. Phoenix Singh here, coming to you to be able to answer a valued viewer's question. You guys know that I love you. Help me and the channel out a ton. Help us optimize with the YouTube algorithm by hitting the like button and also putting a comment below. You can just put an emoji, you can put whatever you like, but it really helps the YouTube algorithm out a ton. If you like academic-related content, be sure to subscribe to the channel and be sure if any of these videos help you out, be sure to also share them on your social media accounts just with a link or to be able to share them with your friends, your colleagues, and your students. So let's go ahead and get started. Today's question is from Shilpa. Shilpa, thank you so much for your question. Shilpa's question was on a video of mine that was called how to get excited about grad school when you didn't get into your top choice. That's a difficult situation, right? Let's say that you've applied to four schools and your number one was really where your heart was and you didn't get in, you were lucky enough to get in somewhere, but it wasn't your number one pick. You have to go through this process of grieving and then all of a sudden on the other end, you know, you may end up, you know, being even more pleased with your decision to be able to go to this other program that you didn't initially anticipate. So go ahead and watch that video though if you happen to find yourself in that situation. But here is what Shilp is asking today. Uh, and it may take me a while to be able to get the, uh, the English right on this one. So just give me a moment, okay? So Shilpa says, really helpful advice. Thank you. Uh, psychology as a field is very versatile, right? Uh, and there are many students who study it as an undergraduate major or minor who later decide to pursue it further as a career. However, my question is, what advice would you give to people who are career changers? So they have one career, then they decide to become a psychologist, right? And uh, people who don't have any prior experience in psychology, but they plan to pursue psychology as a career track uh, as a therapist, a counselor, or a consultant. Okay, so that show up as big question. In other words, just to be able to paraphrase, uh, what if it's something where you didn't plan on being a psychologist, so your undergraduate studies or any graduate studies you've completed are not in psychology, you don't have any experience in the field, and then all of a sudden, Something maybe has happened in your life or time has passed or maybe you've read some research literature or God forbid you've gone through th some hardships uh, with your own family or just with yourself and you've decided you want to be a psychologist. Okay, so uh, the thing that you guys know about me on this channel is that I'm always really, really straightforward um, and I'm a very blunt person, right? So I'll be super duper blunt about it, right? Um, even though it's something where uh, if we come to psychology later in our lives, right, and say this is what we want to do, the, the same rules that would apply as if you are 18 years old, let's say you're 58 and you want to get into the career field. If you're 18 years old, the things that you would need to be able to get into a doctoral program are essentially going to be the same as when you're 58. You're going to have a lot of more experience under your belt, which is great, meaning that hopefully some of the, I would argue, eight things that you're going to need, you'll already have. But there's other things that it sounds like you will definitely not have. So my recommendation for something like this is that you apply to go to a master's degree program first to be able to get uh, to be able to get more credentialed, uh, and also to be able to build up the eight things that I'm about to tell you. Okay. So the first thing that you need to do, Shelp, is to be able to decide on a target supervisor. I have a very structured five-step way of being able to do that. Uh, if you or anybody watching wants to know exactly how to pick a target grad school supervisor, just contact me via the website below, set up a one-on-one -on -one session with me, book a session and I'll take you through it, right? This is tried and true, been doing this for three years now with you guys on the channel and I've been doing it for long before that uh, for my own personal mentees uh, in academia. So make sure that you do that. First, we gotta figure out who the target supervisor is. Then we gotta figure out if they're taking grad students. Then we gotta figure out whether or not they're actually in a program that provides a degree that we're interested in. If so, we got to take a look at the program itself, at the university where it's housed. After we get all of that sorted out, then we need to start looking at data points. For example, for that given program, what is the average or the median grade point average? So the GPA, we need to be there or above, right? Now, the thing is, is that if as an undergraduate, you really didn't do anything in psych, or if psych was your minor, which is not as good as it being your major, then it's something where if there's no undergrad coursework, you should really do a master's degree just to be able to get the foundational education in psych that you would need. Okay, so that's that's number one. We need to get the grade point average 
at or above the median or average, whatever data you can get from the target program. Second one is to the test scores. Again, at or above the median or the average. So if you don't have any experience in psych, uh, it sounds like maybe it could be the case, Shilpa, that you haven't taken a look at either the psych GRE or the general GRE. You got to make sure that you take those, especially for the most competitive programs. Other programs these days, sometimes they don't require the GRE. Oftentimes they don't require the GRE because they want to get more applicants, right? So that's the next thing you should know. Yes, there are some programs who are just like, the GRE is not helping us at all. Weed out students. We don't even have enough applicants to need the GRE to be able to screen people out. And they know that more people are likely to apply to programs where the GRE is not required. And so it makes financial sense for them not to do so. And if they don't see any difference in terms of the quality of the incoming class, then there's also no reason to be able to accept the GRE. Okay? But if you have a program that has 1,000 applicants, you got to screen those people out some way, guys, right? And remember what I talked about in other videos, the GPA and GRE are two principal ways to be able to do that triaging, to be able to do that screening, okay? So let's keep going. Um, ba, 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 ba. So yeah, those are two things. We also need three amazing letters of rec recommendation, including somebody who's got an academic background, preferably in psych, like a psych supervisor. You can get that if you do a master's, right? You won't have it otherwise. Uh, and also if you're career changing and it's been, let's say 10 years since your undergrad, the strength of an academic letter of recommendation from somebody you haven't talked to in 10 years is not gonna be super high. Okay, then you need a letter of recommendation from somebody who knows you really well in terms of working with you in a research capacity, and then somebody who knows you really well working from a clinical capacity or practice based capacity. Okay, um, and so again, those of you who have no experience in psych in terms of research or clinical experience, those are four and five. You must have those, and like a minimum of six months, I would say, right? Um, some people have like three months, it's really not enough. You can give it a shot, but it's really not enough. Minimum of one semester's worth, which I will classify as six months even though it's a little bit less than that, okay? The more research experience you can get, especially for clinical psych PhD programs, the better, okay? And for PsyD programs, you know, more clinical experience. But for PhD programs, you still need clinical experience. So that's what I would say. Then you need experience giving posters or paper presentations at national or international conferences that have good, reputable names. Then you need publications, at least one. And then you also need personal connections with the target supervisor. So if you're going into all of this and you have none of those things, this is going to be an uphill battle. Just remember, I remember when my undergraduate supervisor told me this. And I wanted to curl up in a ball and just die, right? When my undergrad supervisor, who was a really blunt dude himself, and I appreciate it now at the time, I thought it was terrible, right? But he was a really blunt dude and he told me, he says, nobody cares that you're passionate and nobody cares that it's your dream. For everybody who's applying, this is their dream. For everybody applying, they're passionate. Everybody who's applying wants to help people. Everybody who's applying who has, has a life story or whatever that seems very magical and this kind of stuff, right? That makes them seem like the one person who blah, 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 blah. And this broke my little 18-year-old heart. I still remember, guys, the conversation. I mean, I remember going and walking back. I was in Boston. I was walking across the quad, and I was just my little, my little broken 18-year-old heart being like, but my whole life is built up to this. You know, It's all I ever wanted since I was 12 was to be a psychologist. So, so you have to understand that what I just said or whatever, if it's heartbreaking, I get it. right? Uh, but I also know it to be true. Uh, and to be honest with you, I would rather be upset and to know the truth than to be deluded and to just believe in a falsehood that will not get me further, right? So anyway, that's the important thing to know though, is if you came along later in life and decided this is what you wanna do, the requirements are the same, right? So it's not something where you come later and then you have to do all these special things per se. Um, watch other videos of mine for advanced students, for students who are kind of non-traditional, right? Because I've made a number of them now, so that's my recommendation, Shilp, as well. But just remember that um, being a non-traditional student, um, certain things that you may not have thought about can be an uphill battle, things like implicit bias um, from supervisors who may be, I don't know how old you are, Shilpa, but let's say that you're in your 50s and you've got an assistant professor supervisor who's 33, you know, it could be very difficult for them to kind of say, okay, like I need to tell you what to do as my grad student or for you to accept orders from that graduate supervisor, right? Um, remember that if you're working as a postdoc, it's a little bit more collegial, but you're still kind of being given a lot of active guidance. 
as a grad student, the one thing grad supervisors do not want is somebody who's going to come along and act like they know everything and they can tell you what to do and they're just as smart as you and all these sorts of things. It'll drive us nuts. We just don't want to deal with it. We'll just go ahead and say respectfully, we're all set. Thanks so much though. Appreciate your time. And then we'll pass you right along. Right. And whoever does take you on as a supervisor, uh, they're going to try to just break you down. Right. Um, very rare. I mean, I've never heard actually of a case where somebody who's a grad student who has that attitude of like, like, I already know everything that I'm going to do and you need to tell me how to be able to do it and so forth that a grad supervisor has been like, that's exactly what I'm looking for. You just don't find that, guys. Right. Um, so it's an important thing to know because people don't talk about it. It's the truth. So anyway, that's what I would say, though. So again, let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. What advice would you give to people who are career changers, don't have any prior experience in psych psychology, but plan to pursue a psych career track? Yeah, that's all my that's all my recommendations. It's basically the same pieces of recommendation uh, or the same recommendations that I would give to somebody who is 18 years old who wants to get into this in the first place, except it may be a little bit more difficult to accept that you're starting at the bottom of the totem pole when you may have just spent 10 to 20 years in another career where now you're super well established and you know exactly what you're doing and have to accept that now you have to go under the thumb again for half a decade. That could be a little bit difficult. Right. Um, but again, um, my job is to be able to tell the truth. That's the truth of the matter. So thank you guys so much for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.